Good morning and welcome to worship this morning. Today is Sunday the 6th of September and next Sunday, God willing, we will meet together to worship in the building. It's been a long time, six months, since we've been able to gather due to the global pandemic. We are excited and we look forward to seeing each other here in this place of worship. However, things will look slightly different. There will be less chairs. We will have to queue to get in. We will be asked to sit where we don't normally sit. But these are all things we do to show that we care for each other and to protect each other. Over the coming week, there will be more information put on Facebook and on our YouTube channel and our WhatsApp group. So please do keep an eye out for that. There will not be an end to these recorded services for those who cannot get out. Our hope would be that we will record, for want of a better expression, the live service. And then we will make it available again on Facebook and on our YouTube channel later in the day. So that those who are unable to join us can still feel part of this worship. And also on Facebook you will see an opportunity to join in an online joint Holy Communion service. And details of that can be found on our Facebook page as well. But now just in a moment as we come, we come to a call to worship from the psalmist. The psalmist writes, Praise to the Lord, for the Lord is good. Sing to his name, for it is pleasant. Let us unite our hearts in prayer. Let us pray. Sovereign God, we have come to worship you, to declare your faithfulness, to acknowledge your majesty and to marvel at your love. We are here to rejoice, to bring our thanks, to express our wonder and celebrate your goodness. We come before you to seek mercy, to confess our mistakes, to recognise our weaknesses and to ask for your pardon. We come before you to pray for ourselves, our world and one another. Lord of heaven and earth, receive our praise. We come to receive, hungry to receive you, thirsting to know you better, longing to be filled. We come to listen to the message of scriptures, to the words of Christ and to the inner prompting of the Holy Spirit. Sovereign God, accept this time of worship and help us through it draw closer to you. Open our hearts to the love of Christ, our lives to the movement of your Spirit, our minds to all that you are and continue to do. And so we may worship you, not just in these few moments we set aside, but in every moment of our lives. We pray to the glory of your name, Lord of heaven and earth, receive our praise. Amen. <laughs> Our Old Testament reading comes from Psalm 146. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord my soul. I will praise the Lord all my life. I will sing praise to my God as long as I live. Do not put your trust in princes and human beings who cannot save. When their spirit departs, they return to the ground. On the very day their clans come to nothing. Blessed are those who help is in the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord their God. He is the maker of heaven and earth, the sea and everything in them. He remains forever faithful. He, hope, he upholds the cause of the oppressed and gives food to the hungry. The Lord set prisoners free. The Lord gives sight to the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord watches over the foreigner and sustains, sustains the fatherless of, and the widow, but he frustrates the ways of wicked. The Lord reigns forever. Your God, O Zion, for all generations. Praise the Lord.
New Testament reading this morning is taken from John chapter 6, verses 6 to 13. And it's entitled, Jesus Sends Out the Twelve. Then Jesus went around teaching from village to village, calling the twelve to him. He began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over impure spirits. These were his instructions. Take nothing for the journey except a staff. No bread, no bag, no money in your belts. Wear sandals, but not an extra shirt. Whenever you enter a house, stay there until you leave that town. And if any place will not welcome you or listen to you, leave that place and shake the dust off your feet as a testimony against them. They went out and preached that people should repent. They drove out many demons and anointed many sick people with oil and healed them. Amen. In the short passage that John read for us, it gives us five tools to share in the ministry for God's work. Perhaps you're familiar with the saying, tell me and I forget, show me and I remember, let me do and I understand. This was a quote by Confucius. You see, there is only so much you can learn in the classroom. At some point, we're going to have to get some real life experience. If you want to be a teacher, you need to practice working with real kids. If you want to be a mechanic, you need to practice working on real cars. If you want to be a nurse, you need experience working with real sick people. And if you want to be a preacher, you need preaching experience. Your education is not complete until you get out there and use what you have learned. And this is also true of the Christian life. In Mark chapter 6, Jesus teaches his disciples how to do the work of ministry and how he's taking them to the next level. He's saying, all right, you've watched me preach, you've seen me do healings, you've observed me driving out demons, you've watched me love people that have never been loved before, you've seen me do the things that a servant of God would normally do. Now it's your time to do it. I didn't pick 12 apostles so that you could stand around and watch me do all the work. It's time for you now to get some experience. And these apostles were people from different backgrounds and different life experiences. But they had one thing in common, that they were all part of the ministry of believers. And Jesus gives five tools for the ministry. And this applies to the ministry of all believers. First thing he does is gives them a model for ministry. Verse 6 says this. Jesus went around teaching from village to village. Well, you know what I like about that? I like that Jesus leads by example. Before he tells the disciples to go out there and get on with the work of ministry, he was out there doing it first. Jesus didn't hide and tell us what to do from a distance. He came down here, lived among us and showed us what to do. He's a very hands-on practical saviour. And notice that Jesus doesn't wait around for the villagers to come to him. He left Nazareth and went to them. When we teach our children right from wrong, when we discuss Bible stories around a table, when we reach out in Christian friendship to co-workers or neighbours that God has placed in our lives, then we are reaching out with the love of God well beyond the walls of any building. The second thing that Jesus gives us is companionship for ministry. Verse 7. Calling the twelve to him, he sent them out two by two. It was customary in both Jewish and Greek culture to send messages, messengers in groups of two. That way, if something happened to go wrong, there would be witnesses to testify on behalf of the sender. The bottom line is that God never intended you and me to do this work by ourselves. We need help and we need encouragement. Look at the Apostle Paul. As great as he was when the church sent him out on his first missionary journey in Acts 13, they didn't send him out there all alone. They sent him with Barnabas 
And Barnabas means son of encouragement. And we all need that encouragement in our lives. We all need people who will love us, people who will build us up when the Christian life gets tough. Ecclesiastes chapter 4 and verse 9 says this, Two are better than one, because they have a better return for their work. If one falls down, his friend can help him up. But pity the man who falls and has no one to help him up. See, before we try anything new for the Lord, we should pray to God that he would send us a Barnabas, a son of encouragement, someone who will pray for you and work with you and love you. Don't try to do everything by yourself. Get some help. So, so far we have seen that Jesus gives us initially a model for ministry and then companionship. But he also gives us the power for ministry. The second part of verse 7 says this, that he gave authority over evil spirits. Sometimes we may doubt this by saying, I can't serve the Lord. I can't even overcome the demons in my own life, let alone anyone else's. I'm not strong enough. I can't do it. The truth is you're probably right. You're not strong enough. But the great news is that Jesus is not asking us to do this in our own strength. He's not asking us to minister in our own power. He is giving you his power for ministry. If we are in this thing on our own, then we would most likely quit. But we are not alone. Look at what Philippians tells us. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. So Jesus gives his disciples a model, companionship, and power for ministry. The fourth thing he gives us is provisions for ministry. What does verse 8 tell us? Let's listen to these words again. These were, her these were his instructions. Take nothing for the journey except a staff. No bread, no bag, and no money in your belts. Galilee was a very hilly and rocky place. So no traveler would travel without his staff. The staff was very useful stick. It helped to steady yourself when you climbed a rocky hill. And if a wild animal or a thief attacked you, you could use it for defense. So for the traveler, the staff was an indispensable item. And so Jesus very graciously allowed the disciples to take one along. According to verse 9, they could take the clothes on their back and a pair of sandals, and that was about it. Jesus says, travel light. But he did this for a couple of reasons. Number one was to teach the disciples that if they were ever in a situation like this, they will always be able to count on God to take care of them. Remember, for these disciples, this is just a short-term mission project. The apostles are just getting their feet wet. And Jesus wants them to know early on that God's call will never lack God's supply. In fact, two years later, Jesus has the disciples look back on this experience. And in Luke 22, Jesus says, When I sent you without purse, bag, or sandals, did you lack anything? And the disciples replied with one word, nothing. In other words, there was never a time when we did not have what we needed. God always took care of us. God put that in the Bible for a reason. He wants us to know that when we step out in faith to serve him, he will have everything we need to live our lives. Another reason that Jesus told the apostles to travel light was so that they could be totally committed to their mission. That they would not be preoccupied with material things. I suppose it's true to say that in the 21st century we live such comparative comfortable lives. It can be easy to forget that we are here on a mission. We are here to win people for Christ. And we're supposed to be here to minister to the needs in people's lives. In verse 10, Jesus says, Whenever you enter a house, stay there until you leave that town. In other words, don't go running around looking for the nicest possible accommodation. 
In other words, stay where you are welcome. Back then, there were a lot of traveling philosophers wandering around Galilee, and they would stay the night with whoever would take them in. But when someone with a nicer house made them a better offer, they would ditch the first host and then move on to the nicer place. And Jesus is telling his disciples here, don't do that. Don't leave these people with the impression that your ministry is all about you rather than about God. Don't lead them to believe that you're in this only for yourself. It was a custom of any Jewish person who travelled outside of Palestine to carefully shake off the dust of the Gentile territories when they had passed through them. By this action, they disassociated themselves from the sin of those countries and their impending judgment. We all know people that we would love to see come to Christ. But for whatever reason, they are not open to spiritual things at the moment. Perhaps they're just not ready. Keep them in your prayers. God is not through with them yet. But if they get hostile, shake the dust off. But be patient. A story is told of a Christian whose husband was an agnostic. She loved and believed in Jesus with all her heart, and he in turn was derisive and dismissive. A Christian friend gave her this simple advice. Don't talk to your husband about God. Talk to God about your husband. So from these small small number of verses, what we've seen so far is that Jesus gives us a model for a ministry from going place to place, companionship for ministry, a son of encouragement. He gives us power for ministry and he will provide what we need for ministry as well. And lastly, he gives us practice for our ministry. Verse 12 The disciples went out and preached that people should repent. And the word repent here just simply means to change your mind. So the disciples were preaching. People need to change their mind about their sin. They need to change their minds about the way they've been living their lives. And they need to change their minds about Jesus and accept him as a personal Lord and Saviour. I'm sure it's not just too hard to see how this kind of preaching could cause a problem. Some people don't like being told that there are things in their lives that need to change. Some people don't like being told that they have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. They don't like hearing that they need someone greater than themselves to save them. But thank God that this apostolic training session turned out to be a big success. Verse 13 says, They drove out many demons and anointed many sick people with oil and healed them. Perhaps you notice that the disciples did two things. In verse 12, we see them ministering to the people's eternal needs. And in verse 13, we see them ministering to the people's felt needs. The message is that God calls us to minister to the whole person. He's not just concerned about our eternal destiny. He's concerned about our immediate situation. He's concerned about the problems we have right now. And that idea will be reflected in our prayers of intercession. And just as Jesus sent the disciples to the hurting people of Galilee, he is sending us to help the hurting people of our community, of our city, of our country. The passage in Mark teaches us that God never intended for us to be spectator Christians. Again, turning to Ephesians 4. It was he who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, and some to be pastors and teachers, to prepare God's people for works of service that the body of Christ may be built up. In other words, We all need to be involved in some kind of ministry, whatever it is. Whether we're involved in Bible study, whether we're involved in pastoral ministry, whether we're involved in speaking to a neighbour, having a conversation with a stranger, whether we're involved in 
encouraging other believers, whether we're involved in church organizations or external organizations. Each one of us needs hands-on practical experience. Otherwise, our Christian education isn't complete. If we are not using what God gave us, then we're not really learning anything. Be assured that as you work for his kingdom, he will walk with you, guiding, encouraging, providing. Be encouraged. Walk with God in faith. i just leave you with these words from James chapter 1 and verse 5. If anyone lacks wisdom, he should ask God who generously gives to all without finding halt. So let us do all that together. God bless. Stay safe and keep well. Our prayers of intercession, our prayers for ourselves and others. Again, let us unite our hearts in prayer. Loving and living God, we rejoice that this is your world, created by your hand, sustained by your power, guided by your purpose. So now we bring it to you, seeking your blessing in all its affairs. Lord, we pray for our schools and our school children as they return this week back into the classroom. Lord, we pray for people returning to work as furlough slowly winds down. And Lord, we just pray for our health service as they face rising numbers of people infected with COVID-19. But Lord, as we pray, we do not just pray for the big things in life, but also the little things, rejoicing that all situations are important to you and that all people matter in your sight. So Lord, we bring before you the business of each day. Lord, it may be small in the eyes of the world, but it's important to us. We bring before you the responsibilities of family life and parenthood, for caring for each other, for family life and what it means and the changing rhythms of life due to the pandemic. Lord, the pandemic itself has brought about problems with places closing. And so Lord, we pray for those who worry about making a living and making ends meet. And Lord, we pray also especially for the well-being of loved ones. We also bring before you our places of work and recreation, our places of worship and relaxation. Lord, we commit these into your hands, knowing that they matter to you as much as they matter to us. Loving and loving God, we rejoice that you are involved in our world and involved in our lives. You are not distant or remote, but seek the goodness of everything you have made. Gratefully, we put our trust in you. Lord, as we face what we keep referring to as a new normal, we rely on you, Lord, day by day for your strength and your guidance. We pray these things through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And now we pray together using the words of the family prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen.
Remember all God has done. Rejoice in all he is doing. Receive all he shall yet do. Put your hands in his. The God of the past, the present and future. And walk with him wherever he may lead. Knowing that he will walk with you this day and always. Amen. And please share with me in the grace. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. The love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all this day and evermore. Amen.